The enigmatic ruins of Hatra lie hidden in the desert of Iraq, three spectacular square miles of the remains of a once great holy city. Professor Colin Renfrew has journeyed to these hollow halls to report the discovery of their unique people. Time has stood still here at Hatra, and it's a strange experience to walk among the great temples and stone-built monuments of this forgotten city way out in the desert. Excavations have discovered a lost kingdom and life-size statues of its rulers, which bring back, I think, very vividly the days when the armies of Rome marched east beyond the frontiers of the Roman world and were defeated here at Hatra by the sun and by those desert kings. A whole forgotten page of history has been revealed and we're beginning now to learn some of the secrets of Hatra, city of the sun, home of the lost kings of the desert. The first bold European investigator, a doctor named Ross, arrived here 140 years ago. It took him two days' ride across the desert with his guides from the nearest town, and at Hatra itself they were set upon by the fierce Bedouin. I found myself alone, separated from my people whose horses had started, perfectly jammed up by the Arabs and their spears within a few inches of every part of my body. One seized me by the clothes, and my horse, having kicked out at his, the part gave way. Another then seized my gun and pulled me off. I was knocked down and in an instant was nearly naked. Fortunately, Ross got himself out of that spot of bother and lived to tell the tale. And what he saw amply repaid his journey. He came to the middle of a great city with stone buildings standing at its very heart. Who built them and when is a matter for question. But certainly this one, with its great line of columns here, looks rather like a Greek or Roman temple because columns like that are not a Near Eastern style. And the decoration also has got a very Greek or Roman look. And it stands in front of a wall which leads to an inner court. There are temples on each side here. And this has got those Grecian looking pillars again. But it's got a very curious arch. There's nothing Greek about that. The Arabs call this site al Hadar, And Ross and the early travellers who knew their classical authors very well, soon realized that this is the ancient city of Hatra, mentioned by one or two Greek and Roman authors. This astonishing facade is really the most remarkable thing about Hatra, a great series of arches leading into these vaulted chambers called Iwans. And an Iwan is simply a chamber open at one side and one can see they are vaulted because the springing of the vault is extremely clear. This great chamber is actually more than a hundred feet long and when the vault was complete it was more than fifty feet high and it must have been absolutely stunning. Is it a palace or a temple? Certainly there are heads groups of three heads looking down from the wall. And then there's a whole row of rather impressive, almost imperial looking eagles. There are some inscriptions on the walls and these could be read quite easily because they're in Aramaic, which is the language spoken in this area uh, around the time of Christ. Indeed, it's the language spoken by Jesus himself. Then there's another dating clue. There is this head, which is very much like the Greek Gorgon's head, with the snakes coming out of the hair. The Gorgon was the being in the story of Perseus, who turned people to stone as soon as they looked at her. And this is the dating clue, because if it shows Greek influence, it must be after the time of first Greek settlement in this area, that is to say, after the time of Alexander the Great. Alexander was the first to open up the East to Europeans. In only ten years following 334 BC, 
he conquered an area stretching from the Mediterranean to India. And under the rule of Seleucus, one of Alexander's generals, and the Seleucid dynasty, a large part of the East remained in Hellenic hands for 150 years. Colonists and soldiers spread Greek ideas on religion and architecture throughout the empire. Hatra itself lay halfway across the region of European control. Then the pattern shifted. The Parthians, rulers from the east, took over most of the Seleucid Empire, and from the west the Parthians themselves were challenged by the growing power of Rome. Soon after Christ's death, the superpowers stood eyeball to eyeball in the desert. Hatra had changed from a Hellenic center into a frontier outpost controlled by Parthia. Like many Parthian cities, Hatra's plan is circular, a shape which keeps the five-mile length of the walls as short as possible. The temples and the tombs to the northeast were examined before the First World War by Walter Andre, the earliest archaeologist to study the remains of Hatra. Andre's chief clue was the inscriptions. They produced a few personal names and dedications to the gods and first identified Hatra as a city of Parthian date. But the plundered tombs yielded no secrets of Hatra's forgotten people. The city remained a mystery, the masonry of its tombs and temples unique among all the remains of ancient Iraq a stone-built wonder in a land where nearly every building is made of mud brick. The ancient cities of Mesopotamia flourished in river valleys. Animals, crops and people all depended on the waters of the twin rivers Tigris and Euphrates. On these fertile plains great civilizations flowered. The Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians. Only 30 miles from Hatra, but a world removed, is Ashur, first capital of Assyria. Its tallest monument is a ziggurat, a colossal pyramid-like artificial hill. Even without its crowning temple, the ziggurat stands 90 feet high. All of it is made of mud brick, and the bricks can be seen where the surface is freshly eroded. Here on the great river plains, there is mud, nothing but mud. So everything has to be made of mud, buildings the lot. Indeed, the old Assyrian creation legend has it that man himself was made of mud by the gods, who then put uh, blood in to breathe life into him. Indeed, it's very like our own Bible creation story, and perhaps it has the same origin. Anyway, in order to make buildings, one has to prepare mud bricks using the old traditional methods that have been going on for thousands of years, and they are made up here, set out to dry in the sun for a day or two, and then one can go ahead and build, and just about all the villages in this area are made of mud brick in this way, which is a very effective and very cheap building material. The only equipment required is spades to turn the heap and a wooden frame to form the bricks. The builder's skill lies in making the mixture liquid enough to fill the mould easily, but not so wet that it takes days to dry. Sun-baked mud bricks last many years, especially in a dry climate. When they do decay, the mightiest empire built with them
vanishes completely. As each brick building collapses, it forms a new higher ground level on which fresh houses are put up. Over many generations, huge city mounds called tells are built up this way. This was Nineveh. The prophet Jonah called Nineveh a city of three days' journey, so great was its extent. Its founder was Sennacherib, who ruled Assyria in 700 BC. He was the king who came down like a wolf on the fold when he attacked Jerusalem. At Nineveh, his mud-brick gates have been reconstructed. Inside the gates, a few farmers now live on the obliterated remains of the great city. Recognisable pieces only survive where stone was imported for the king to be used in the conspicuous consumption of his palace. This relief from Sennacherib's throne room still catches the arrogance and cruelty of the Assyrian monarch with his splendid beard. Stone endures, mud crumbles. That's one reason why these reliefs are all that's to be seen of majestic Nineveh, while Hatra, 90 miles away, stands four square to this day. Near the city, the old quarries are still in use, providing stone for restoration work. Hatra stands on a limestone outcrop. The stone is found in layers with flat surfaces on top and beneath, rather like a pack of very thick cards. It's straightforward to split off roughly square blocks using wedges. The quarrymen of ancient Hatra worked in much the same way to produce the huge volumes of stone needed for the city walls and the temples. The freshly quarried stone is soft and can be cut with a saw. All the tools in use today were available to the workmen 2,000 years ago. Only one saw cut is needed to give the stone a good outside face. The other less perfect surfaces are hidden when the stone slots into place in a reconstructed wall.
A two-pronged programme run by the Iraqi Directorate of Antiquities is excavating the buildings still hidden beneath the dunes and restoring those in the temple area. Thirty years ago, many of the big monuments were in bad shape. Even though it is built of stone, the temple of Shahiru possessed only a fragment of its arched roof, and the Iwans themselves stood waist-deep in their own rubble. Luckily for the restorers, many parts of the masonry jigsaw puzzle still lay on the ground, waiting to be fitted back into place. And elsewhere, the Iraqi excavators have made dramatic discoveries in the buried buildings. Archaeologist Dr. Majid al-Shams. What is this building here, Majid? It is one of the shrines found outside the great temple of the city. This is termed by the excavators as uh, Shrine 3, and supposed to be restricted to a certain god called Baal Shemin, which means the Lord of the Heaven. In this shrine, we found important statues, and the most important one, where it seems erected here, was that of King Athlo, found in two pieces well-dressed and nicely carved. Besides that, uh, we found statues of some noble men, also a god and uh, some female deities, and uh, two uh, money cases. And when did the Iraqi excavations in Hatra begin? Excavations took place in the city since the year 1951. During these years, we found a lot of statues. We unearthed 11 such temples. Of course, as you see the city, some parts it is necessary to be reconstructed because it supports other parts and to give a better idea. So to preserve them, we need to uh, construct them uh, partially. And what are the main finds of the excavations at Hatra? Well, we unearthed now over than uh, 300 inscriptions and numerous statues, some of them representing kings or princes or merchants, and this could give us a brief idea about the social formation of the people in Hatra. I'd like you to meet King Sanatruk. This is one of the very few sites where you almost get to meet the people who live there. And this is a statue of the king with his royal eagle on the diadem and his splendidly royal hairstyle and his costume just covered in jewels and gems and his right hand is raised in the attitude of prayer because the statue was a dedication to the gods. Then over here, we've got a man with a dress which is much less smart. It's the same kind of kaftan and baggy Parthian trousers, but no jewels this time. And he's a scribe, and he's got a roll of parchment in his left hand. And then beside him is a priest, and he's again dressed in a different way, and in his left hand he carries an incense cup for his priest's incense. And he has a rather sober expression, perhaps something to do with his calling. And the splendid thing about Hatra is there are just dozens and dozens of statues of these kinds which give you the impression that you're meeting the people of the city, lords and kings and princes and princesses and warriors. And then we have these two remarkable eagles. And the eagle is the emblem of Hatra. And the bigger one is actually covered in jewelry, which I imagine in real life would have been rich golden jewelry. And round his neck, he's got a pendant, which is the emblem of the sun god. And these stood on high poles, and this is the heraldic symbol of Hatra, the royal city. This statue is one of my favorites. 
with his great long sword and his almost hippie hairstyle and his very tough expression, he's somebody one would rather have on the same side in the field of battle. And this is the Princess Doshfari. She's got rather splendid folds in her robe. She's got rich jewellery. But in fact, the best thing about her is the inscription, and it's a very important one. In the month of September of the year 549, a statue of Doshfari, daughter of Sanatruk, the king, son of Absamya, the king, and of Bitsamya, the mother of the crown prince, was erected to her by the son of Abjaili, son of Santandel, her friend. This inscription allows us to make a start with building up the family tree of the kings of Hatra. We have the princess Doshfari, and she is the daughter of Sanatruk the king, and he is the son of Absamya the king. So that allows us to build up the first block of the family tree. For the next link, we have to go to the temples of Hatra. A doorway at the back of the Great Iwan leads to a temple where another statue was found. The head is missing, but it's the inscription which matters. The statue of Sanatruk, the king of the Arabs, the victorious, son of Nasru the Lord, son of Nasser Yahab. This inscription talks about a king, Sanatruk, but his father is Nusru. And this must mean that there are two King Sanatruks. And this allows us to fill in another block on the family tree. Because if we put down Sanatruk and his father, as the inscription says, is Lord Nusru, and his father is Lord Nasser Yahab, then we've got another block on the family tree. And there's other evidence that suggests that this group is earlier than Doshfari and her father and grandfather. So this chap here is Sanatruk I, we'll call him, and the other one, Sanatruk II. Now, there are various other bits of evidence which suggest that they don't actually prove uh, that this chap here, Sanatruk I, is the father of Ab Samia, and that means we can link the whole lot together like this. So that gives us a basic background skeleton, as it were. Then there are over 300 inscriptions at Hatra, although only a few of them are dated, and that allows us to fill out, really, the complete family of the forgotten rulers of Hatra, the lost kings of the desert, uh, and just about all of them have names hitherto unknown to history. We're now in a position to reconstruct something of the history of Hatra, using first of all the family tree, second the evidence from the rather few classical authors who mention Hatra, and thirdly, the architectural remains. And this building, with its Greek-looking colonnade, must certainly be very early, well before the construction of the great Ewans. On the other hand, Greek-looking it may be, but this little arch here is very un-Greek, so it can't be too early. Probably somewhere around the time of Christ, which puts it some time before the Sanatruk dynasty. The first ruler of Hatra, whose name we know, was Nasser Yahab. And he wasn't king, he was known as Lord, the Lord of Hatra. And he was responsible for designing and beginning this great series of Ewans. But they were completed by his son, Nasru, who was initially Lord Nasru, but later on took the title of king. And he was the person who completed them, building these two at the end here. It was during his time that the Romans made their first attack on Hatra. The Roman Emperor Trajan had swept through Parthia, capturing the capital at Ctesiphon. By 116 AD, he had advanced as far as the shores of the Persian Gulf. But behind him, the newly conquered territories broke out in revolt, 
and Trajan retraced his steps to put down the uprising. Hatra was one of the rebellious cities. This city is neither large nor prosperous, and the surrounding country is mostly desert and has neither water, save a small amount and that poor in quality, nor timber nor fodder. The very disadvantages, however, afforded protection, making impossible a siege by a large multitude. The Emperor Trajan attacked, but the Roman cavalry was hurled back into the camp and the sun god protected Hatra by sending a withering heat and clouds of flies which descended on the Romans and on their food. The emperor Trajan himself was nearly killed. He set aside his imperial mantle and rode along outside the walls, but he was spotted by his grey head and his august countenance. The Hatrans fired and his escort was killed, and the whole attack was a disaster. In fact, the emperor took ill and died while returning to Rome. These were Hatra's golden days, and the ruler, Lord Nusru, took the title of king, and his son and successor, Sanatruk, called himself King Sanatruk the Victorious. And I like to think that he did so because of his part in his father's famous victory over Trajan. A joyful frieze of revellers and musicians dates from this time of peace and prosperity. Minstrels at the court of King Sanatruk. Prince Absamya followed his father Sanatruk to the throne. A statue of him as a young man was found in a monumental porch at the rear of the Temple of the Sun. During his reign, Septimius Severus mounted the second Roman attack on Hatra. Severus came to the territory of the Atreni, where he laid siege to Hatra, a city encircled by enormous strong walls and teeming with arches. Every kind of siege engine was used against the walls and no technique of siege operation was left untried. The Romans found the attack on Hatra no easy task. First of all, they were met by showers of arrows from the walls. Then the defences are particularly well organised because approaching the gate, you have to have your shield on your left arm, then the sword in your right hand and you're wide open to all the missiles thrown down from the walls. And then they had some rather nasty surprises in store for the Romans. They made little clay containers which they filled with flies and stinging insects. And these were slung out from the walls into the Roman forces and bit them uh, very unpleasantly. And then perhaps most unpleasant of all, they had their Roman or Parthian version of napalm, and that is bitumen. Bitumen is found locally in tar pools and this the Hatrans had on the walls and they lit it and it came down in flames onto the Roman siege machines and onto the Roman soldiers so that in the words of the ancient author they were consumed in fire. Roman honour was at stake and despite losses through heat stroke and many wounds from the arrows the soldiers actually managed to make a breach in the wall and they were all set to break through keen to go and plunder the temple of the sun god of all its treasures but the emperor unexpectedly called a halt and he knew and they knew that if the arab king absamia surrendered to him the emperor then all the treasures would by the rule of uh, war be his own 
And so he decided he would give the Arab king 24 hours to surrender. But the king didn't surrender. And during the night, he and the Hatrons rebuilt the wall. So that next morning, the Romans found the new wall confronting them. And when the emperor gave the orders to attack, the Roman legionaries, the European legionaries, had had enough, and they refused. And the attack was a failure. Thus, heaven saved the city. When one of his associates promised that if Severus could only give him 550 European soldiers, he would destroy the city, Severus said, and where am I to get so many soldiers? Referring to their disobedience. Tormented by lack of water, the humiliated Romans withdrew. They had lost again to people who knew better how to use the desert and its resources. And Hatra had a hidden advantage, one which also explains its choice as a site. Hatra had a population of many thousands of people. And the middle of a waterless desert may seem rather a strange place to build so great a city. The desert looks green enough just now, but that's after rainfall. Uh, and indeed crops will grow after it's rained, but one can't rely on that for a source of food or indeed for all one's water. There are great cisterns to collect the rainfall underneath the temple area, but I think the secret of Hatra is really the geology, because there are underground streams near the city, and there are plenty of wells in the city, which were a major source of water, of drinking water. And then above all, there is this great sacred lake. And this is the only stretch of open water for miles around. And for a people of the desert, it must have been remarkable to have this water in a great lake like this. Who were the people who lived at Hatra? Why did they pour out their money, time and effort to raise a great city in this desert region? This is a paradox. A city of the nomads. Inscriptions found during the excavations suggest that these city dwellers were not Parthians, but Arabs, over 600 years before the rise of Islam. The inscription says that this is the statue of Walgash, king of the Arabs. What is the evidence for the Arabs here at Hatra? First, inscriptions left by the people of Hatra themselves. And uh, the Romans, sometimes they mention the kings uh, of Hatra as Arabs. And do we imagine that some of these Arabs might have been nomads, rather like the Bedouin of today? Yes, of course. In uh, such an area, uh, it is not possible for everybody to be civilized. There should be some civilized centers and some other people who are living in the desert near some springs and they show their skills sometimes to develop their environment. The nomadic Arabs seem to have had winter quarters in Hatra. Their wealth, and probably that of the city, was based on goats and sheep, still tended near Hatra today. The black tents of the Bedouin are a familiar feature of the area around Hatra. It's a nomadic way of life, based on herds of sheep and goat and the tents themselves are made of goat hair. And if you enjoy Bedouin hospitality, which is justly famous, you'll be offered lamb's meat and yogurt, which is made of sheep's milk. But the bread, or generate the flour for the bread, is obtained by exchange in the market. 
For the archaeologist, the Bedouin are always something of a problem because there's almost nothing here for the archaeologist to find when the Bedouin encampment moves away. But despite that, I think it's a very safe bet that the nomad encampments of the Bedouin have been around Hatra for thousands of years. And of course, Hatra served them as a great religious focus and center and offered also many of the facilities of town life. any Near Eastern city today is the bazaar. We can't be certain that Hatra had a bazaar, but we can be sure that the nomads needed to come there in order to get farming products that they couldn't grow themselves. Things like wheat and lentils and beans and peas. And in exchange, they would bring their animal products, their sheepskins, the wool, the goat hair, and of course the cheese from the sheep's milk, all the things that they were producing. Then they could buy in the town the town's own products, pottery for instance, if they wanted it. And then there were the things the traders brought, uh, silks and other exotic things, perhaps right from the east. But it doesn't follow that Hatra was primarily a commercial city. And in fact, I think it's likely that it was above all a religious center, the city of the sun god. This huge Iwan is dedicated to the great god Shamash, the sun god, the principal deity of Hatra. And behind it is his temple, the Holy of Holies. This really is an extraordinary building with its lofty vaults and its square plan and all these large, well-dressed blocks of limestone. It really rather reminds me of a Crusader castle and the impression is reinforced by these statues here who might be crusader knights. It was near here that there was found a remarkable carved relief of Shamash, the sun god himself, called simply my lord, that is the lord of Hatra. And we know it's the sun god because it has rays radiating from his head, solar rays. And with it was found a relief of his wife called simply my lady and another relief uh, of his son, called Son of My Lord, and he has a crescent uh, at the lower part of the figure, which clearly indicates that he is the moon god. And these three were the principal deities of Hatra. There's a whole remarkable range of gods and goddesses at Hatra, found in the various temples, and they represent a diversity of traditions. This is a very good example. It's supposed to represent Balshamin, who's a traditional Mesopotamian deity. 
and he's got the beard very much in a Syrian style that one sees on statues and reliefs of seven or eight hundred years earlier. Then at his feet, he's got this figure, which is very much a Greek figure of the goddess Fortune, and she's entirely in Greek style. And then round the back, he's got a head on his back, which is the Gorgon's head, or looks like the Gorgon's head, again very much in Greek style, just as we saw on the Iwans at Hatra itself. And of course there are Greek statues, or at any rate Roman statues in Greek style at Hatra. There's a very striking statue of Apollo that is pure Roman copy of a Greek original. And one finds the Greek and Roman style adopted even in statues of pure Arab deities like the goddess Alat. And she is seen with two other goddesses, but she is wearing a helmet with a spear and a shield, very much in the guise of the Greek goddess Athena. And all of it is rather well symbolized, I think, in this statue, because he's dressed as a Roman soldier, effectively. He has these Greek elements, he has his Assyrian beard, there are eagles here, which may be the eagles of Zeus, and on his breast he has the symbol of the sun god Shamash, the supreme deity of Hatra. The sculptures from Hatra are the richest collection of art we have from the Parthian period. This is King Athlu, king of a city near Hatra, and this is a Hatran king, which we can recognize by the symbol of the sun god and the moon god, which he has on his belt. Although they're here in the east, they're about the same date as much Roman sculpture, but they're very different in style, and they're less pompous for one thing. And although there's plenty of Greek style art here in Hatra, and these sculptures are probably descended from it, again, they're very different from that too. They don't have the same freedom of movement of Greek art. Instead, they are fixed and immobile. But I certainly don't find them lifeless. They've got a quality of Parthian art, which one calls frontality. They are four square on to the viewer. One doesn't see them in profile, one doesn't see them half face. They are four square on with this tremendous presence. And this is a quality which continues through to the art of the early Middle Ages. One sees it in Byzantine frescoes as well. And I think it's something that these things get from Parthian art of the Hatra period. But of course, the main thing is to enjoy them for what they are. And I think they are splendid works. Look at the wonderfully rich decoration on this man's clothing. All the pearls, almost pearly kings. And the splendid tiara he's wearing. But above all, this enormous presence which is what I think makes these really major works of art. Difficult times faced Hatra in the reign of Sanatruk II. The Parthians were driven out by aggressive new rulers, the Sasanians. Ardashir, their leader, tried to bring Hatra under direct rule. He failed. Shapur, his successor, was a greater force to be reckoned with. Sanatruk reversed tradition and made alliance with Hatra's old enemy, Rome. Statues of the Roman god Hercules have been found at Hatra. This one was dedicated by Roman legionaries stationed there. But the presence of the Romans acted as a provocation to the Sasanians rather than a shield against them. Hatra's days were numbered. King Shapur, the great Sasanian monarch, attacked in the year 241. And at first he had a very hard time and this gateway here is littered with cannonballs, probably the cannonballs in the supply of King Sanatruk, which he hurled out and his forces hurled out at the Sasanians. And in fact, Hatra was lost through treachery. It was the daughter of King Sanatruk who went out one night to meet her lover, as the Arab historian tells it, uh, and left open a door or something, and the next morning the Sasanian forces rushed in. And there was slaughter, and that was the end of Hatra, which was never again inhabited. Indeed, as the Arab historian put it, the bride's destiny was streams of blood when the day broke. The Arab poets lamented. Does not the spreading news of what happened to the night reveler of Alubaid sadden you? And the death of Daizan and his father's sons and the allied legions from Tazid? 
Shapur advanced towards them with exalted elephants and with the brave. He pulled down stones from the tower of the citadel as if their heaviness were like a core of iron. The new Sasanian kings built their capital here at Ctesiphon near Baghdad. And here Shapur the Great built himself a huge palace. And the central part is this tremendous vault, which is of course an E1. It's the biggest E1 in the world with a great arch 30 meters high made of mud brick. And this tradition, this Parthian and Hattran tradition of building Iwans, continues right down into Muslim architecture. One sees it in the great mosques of the classical Muslim architectural period, and so into recent times. And it was in this great hall that the king sat enthroned in majesty, with a tremendous golden crown on his head. And this image is one that echoes down through the centuries, the king in majesty, the Christ in majesty it becomes in Byzantine times and so into the Middle Ages, where we see statues which have many resemblances with those of Hatra. They have the same Parthian frontality. And so here is something which persists from Hatra through the Sasanian period into the Byzantine period and so into the art of the West. We now know that Hatra played its part in artistic, architectural and religious changes in East and West. That 600 years before Islam, it foreshadowed Mecca as a holy city for the rising power of the Arabs. That much more waits to be discovered, preserved since the moment of Hatra's sudden overthrow. There are secrets still hidden beneath the sands. King Shapur the Great killed or deported the entire population of Hatra and the city was abandoned and stayed abandoned. All of which is really quite good news for the archaeologist because like ancient Pompeii, Hatra was destroyed in a day and there was no settlement later nearby to come and plunder the stone. And so the city stood and crumbled for 1700 years. As early as 363 AD, the Roman writer Ammianus Marcellinus described its romantic isolation and solitude. Hurrying on by forced marches, we approached Hatra, an old city lying in the midst of a desert and long since abandoned. The warlike emperors Trajan and Severus tried at various times to destroy it, but almost perished with their armies.